I think you probably just need a new word. You know, I feel like I'm sat in my A-level history <laughs> school. You know, and that's what most people think. If you, if you say the word communism, I looked at it on what we were going to discuss today and I went, what? Laura Hughes's spiel there represents a common talking point from well-meaning liberals. I was really, really happy when Ash Saka went on live TV and actively labelled as a communist. It might not be my particular clientele, but whether you like it or not, stuff like this is a win for the left. Many of us have the idea to hide away from explicit references to our ideology because it's just so far removed from every day. Now, this is well understood. There's no shortage of quacks and loons in the world that come across to us as ridiculous and never going to appease anyone. Except when they do. So it's frequent then to think we should instead take up a new ideology embrace a new ism, or at least alter and transform our perceptions into a new label in order to come across as more appealing to the kids. And I think that's what I mean by a new word. People felt it didn't work. Yeah. And so when you hear it, that's why I said I felt like I was back at school being taught about how communism hadn't worked. So this practice should be avoided at all costs. And here's why. If we value the works of Karl Marx, our relationship to that, I think, should be one that reflects it. We must thereby also recognize that the works of Marx and Engels do not exist in a vacuum, in total isolation from one another, but rather they're part of a shared history that includes various people who were all inspired by one another up to this day. They took from it, applied it, and developed it in practice over a long period of time, and they all used the word communism. If we were to disguise this word with something else to sound more palatable, something more generic, more there, yeah, Goodingtonism, that would be the first step in removing ourselves from that shared history. And what would happen is we would lead ourselves onto a confusing and utterly ambiguous path. It's easy to think that keeping this label will give our enemies more firepower. Objection! But this is the opposite of the truth. In practice, I find it creates ever more uncertainty obfuscates our ability to argue, and gives our opponents, frankly, the upper hand. I might also say that it makes me feel you're not taking this seriously by hopping from one word to another once it becomes undignified to the public. You do know, people already have weird conceptions about us. They think we're mysterious, we like to hide our past away from prying eyes. Do you not think that changing the name or label would simply just add to this stereotype? How long is it before you're simply going to be heading down the ballot box route because you've exhausted all other options? I think this question ultimately begs a grander point. I don't want to be disingenuous. I want people to learn about this stuff. And this is what separates us from many other different groups and ideologies. If we were to reject communism on the grounds that it alienates the public, why stop there? Even prior to the Soviet Union, socialism was still covered in a ton of negative stigma anyway. Why not therefore reject Marxism proper? It's much more appealing to talk about this Kautsky guy who's really popular now and he appeals more to the public. We should just be social democrats. It's easier that way, it attracts a bigger base, you know. I would like to remind folks that there are tendencies out there whose very existence creates the basis for the almost entire introductory point of said ideology. But this has not stopped those people from reclaiming the word and doing good with it. Could we not say that anarchism was the wrong word to use because it brings up images of crime and destruction? And that's bad. No. We would never do that. That would be rightly deemed capitulation. You may have noticed that Lenin has received a bit of a renaissance in interest in recent times. Even many self-proclaimed anti-authoritarians have admired his intellect. Or at least, relatively compared to others. This is not an accident. It's only because people took it upon themselves to remove the historical baggage that had been attached to him. To talk about him. Openly. To demystify him in proper context. If this had not occurred, Lenin the intellectual would have still been Lenin the dictator to the world at large. If this was the case for Lenin, I wonder who's going to be next. People to this day still have the overwhelming feeling that the USSR was a society simply of breadlines, hunger, and famine. A more plausible reality is that famines only represented the earlier period up until 1934. 
Throughout the majority of the post-World War II period, average caloric intake was on par with the USA, and bread lines, like food shortages, were uncommon, with the exception of specific periods of duress, quite like what occurs in various other systems. Now, there's a good chance much of this you wouldn't have known about until I just told you. This is what I'm getting at. If you reject the label because it's alienating, you reject all research into why people have these alienatable views in the first place. And you will never solve the contradictions this way. Being communists, it would be good to observe what the outcomes have been of removing this label, and indeed we can. You could, for example, look at the Venus Project by the late Jacques Fresco, or maybe someone like Paul Mason and his popularizing of the term post-capitalism. Then we might look at the Zeitgeist Movement, which was probably America's most famous attempt at a new synthesis. When I look at these, I can't help but feel cynical. Does it really appear like any of these are going anywhere in the grand scale of things? The Zeitgeist Movement is basically dead in the water at this point. It was submerged with conspiracy theories and a fundamental lack of any material basis to begin with, which limited its ability to evolve. Post-capitalism, at least if Mason is anything to go by, appears to be effectively conceding defeat as if we could ever peacefully transition away from our dilemma. And as for the Venus Project, well, it's admirable to see this kind of stuff, but it's hardly expanded despite valiant efforts. It remains largely a singular communal project. And I can't help but feel this suffers into the futurologist-style, post-capitalism scenario without any theoretical basis. Videos like these attract a hell of a lot of views, sure, but how effective is internet amazement porn at creating a movement? I think it stands to reason that we should not have a deviation without also having a continuity. To reject or move away from the term because it's perceived to have failed or doesn't jam well would never be a particularly sound method in any other discipline or field. This is lazy, and it places you decisively on the defensive. When you talk about these ideas, truthfully, honestly, in ways the people can understand, folks will not give a damn about the word, just like you didn't. The right wing have been able to get so big in recent times because they've been able to answer people's questions willingly, get rid of all the doubts they have and give them reassurance. The left, by comparison, has tended to focus too heavily on responding to the occurrences on the right without ever really pushing forward our ideas into that limelight. The outcome of this has only led to those people who probably should not be calling themselves socialists or communists taking that spot. And if you control the narrative, you control the message. We will always need to be there to offer that message. That you can run. And then when the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism, what it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, instead of the genocidal massacres because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. We might want to give some credence to old Geordie here. In the words of Boots Riley, yes, that Boots Riley, it's really the result of anti-communism that people tend to call themselves vanilla anti-capitalists. A lot of folks will say, that's not true, but it's a way to say, I'm not part of those mistakes that happened before. In reality, we are all part of those mistakes. Whether you call yourself a child of that legacy or not, you are. We have to look at those things. That is why I call myself a communist. Because the world that even anarchists are saying they want to create is ultimately a communist world. We don't gain anything from the ignorance of our history, and it is our history. I don't want a left who's scared not to ask the difficult questions because they are going to bring them up, and you sure as hell better have a better answer than just bland avoidance. If we'd all focused on just being Tiffany Tumbles, how many of us would known anything about the feminine penis? Call it a new word, a new label, a new logo for Christ's sake. Fact is, what you're talking about is communism. When we talk about communism, we are, whether we like it or not, talking about 
this legacy, referring back to some long before time removed from revolutionary tradition, again, just sets us back and guides our eyes away from the science. Yes, the science. Vagueness is not a boon. It only leads us to greater ambiguity from our collective goal and more ammo for the opposition to use against us. This is good shit, and you should not be afraid to talk about it or its legacy, because we are all a part of it, whether we like it or not.